So hi everyone, welcome to the Oxford OpenCon satellite event, um, which is hosted by the Bodleian Libraries and Crossref. This is our sixth event, but our first event online. Usually we meet in the Western Library in Oxford. And whilst it's a shame that this year we were unable to see any of you in person, it's also great to have the opportunity to welcome so many attendees from further afield. Um, so do feel free to say hello in the chat. Uh, let us know where you're joining from today, um, seeing as we can't uh, talk in person. Um, so this afternoon, we'll have two panel sessions uh, for our speakers who will share the work that they're doing, the importance of openness and issues around openness in the context of their work and the current pandemic. Plus, we'll have time for live questions and discussion afterwards. The presentations will be in English and everyone apart from the presenter will be on mute. If you have questions during the presentations, please feel free to write these in the Q&A box. Um, this also allows your fellow attendees to uh, vote on questions they also think are interesting and you can comment on other people's questions as well. This event is being recorded and we will share the recording and the presentation materials uh, via email, most likely uh, sometime next week. If you do want to share any insights from today on Twitter, uh, you can find uh, the OpenCon handle and the hashtag on the slide there as well. So first, a little bit about OpenCon. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so OpenCon is a, um, a annual conference, um, which is for students and early career researchers. Um, it tells them all about open access, open education, open data, allows people to develop critical thinking skills and catalyze action towards a more open system for the sharing of world information um, from scholarly and scientific research, education materials and digital research data. Alongside this, they also have a bunch of satellite events, such as this one, which they've held in, I think, over 44 countries and 24 different languages. Um, and they also have uh, monthly community calls, um, local projects and initiatives, and um, other um, work that they're doing as well in the open space. They're run by, um, in collaboration with Spark, and they are globally governed by a, a committee of early career um, researchers. If you want to find more about OpenCon, you can visit the website on the screen there. And I should also tell you briefly a bit about Crossref. Uh, myself and my colleague Rachel, um, who's on the on the webinar today, and she's going to be helping moderate as well. We're in the community outreach team at Crossref. Uh, Crossref's mission is to make research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. We're a not-for-profit membership organization that exists to make scholarly communications better. Publishers and other organizations join Crossref in order to uh, register their content with us and create a persistent identifier or DOI for their piece of content. They also send us a lot of metadata about this content, such as author names, abstracts, references, license information, and more, which we then make openly available via search interfaces and APIs. The metadata that our members share um, creates and powers an open scholarly infrastructure, and it's used in a wide variety of different tools and services in the scholarly community. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague Sarah Barkler from the Bodleian, who's also going to give a bit of an introduction, and then we'll get kicked off with the first panel. I would second all of the good afternoon and welcome that Vanessa and Rachel have extended. Uh, my name's Sarah Barkler, and I'm the Copyright and Licensing Officer for the Bodleian, uh, which for those who may not be aware is the name of the University of Oxford Libraries. Uh, I'm also the Acting Open Access Librarian at the current time. Uh, usually at this point in previous years, I'd be welcoming you to the Bodleian's Lecture Theatre in the Western Library. So this is a little bit different, even though we've probably all got quite used to working in a virtual environment by now. Uh, one of the good things about this year is despite having to have physical libraries close, uh, the Bodleian was able to make a significant difference to the shift uh, to virtual teaching and learning. Uh, the physical libraries um, weren't available, but we had new services that we were able to get up and running fairly quickly, including Scan and Deliver, which ended up delivering in the millions of items to our, our, um, our students and our, our academics. 
uh, I was required <laughs> to provide help, advice and support on moving teaching content online, as there's a lot you can do in a face to face lecture that you can't actually provide online uh, from a copyright perspective and licensing. Uh, the other big plus was the institutional repository, which is called Aura, had I think 1.3 million downloads last year and up until the end of November and mostly between April and November of this year, we've had 2 million. So it does demonstrate the value of having that content that's open. So once again, welcome to everybody to the, to the sessions this afternoon. And I will pass back to Rachel to introduce the first session. Excellent. OK, um, thanks. Um, thanks, Vanessa. And um, and thanks, Sarah. Is that, and thanks to um, um, to those who've joined us today. Um, and you can said, as Vanessa said, you can introduce yourselves in the um, in the chat. Um, you can see that we've got a fairly um, we've got a fairly packed program today. Um, one of the um, the nice things about organizing um, this session is that we we kind of get to invite people who um, who we've heard are doing interesting things that we want to hear about over the course of the year. So we're excited to have such a um, fantastic range of panelists. Um, those of you who are um, familiar with Zoom, you can either, I, I'm going to say you can ask questions in the chat or using the Q&A window um, and we'll, we'll feed those um, um, onto the, onto the panellists. But I don't want to eat into our panellists' time at all. So let me start off with introducing the first of, the first of our speakers. Um, so Reggie Raju is the Director of um, Research and Learning at the University of Cape Town Libraries. Um, he's been in academic libraries for more than 30 years and holds a PhD in Information Studies. He's the author of more than 65 publications in peer-reviewed nation, national and international journals, chapters in books and book publications. Um, he's an NRF rated researcher with the research focus of open access and is currently a member of the Academic and Research Library Standing Committee of IFLA, as well as being the co-convener of its special interest group, Library Publishing. Um, I met Reggie in his, um, in his capacity as the chair of Spark Africa, and he's driving the social justice agenda of open access for Africa, which he'll talk about today. And he also serves in the editorial board of Journal of Librarianship and, and Scholarly Communication. So Reggie, thank you for agreeing to, to speak today. Um, I'll let you um, share your slides and then take us forward from, from here. Thank you. So. Great. Yep. I can, we can see you and we can see your slides and hear you. So you're all set. Thank you very much, Rachel. And I also want to thank um, the, the CrossRef colleagues and the Bodleian colleagues uh, for the invitation to share with uh, everybody the, the issue of inclusivity uh, being a golden thread in, in open access. I am going to put my video off um, just to save bandwidth. So I hope you. Uh, the delegates don't mind that. Sorry, I do apologize. My kids got a little sticky. Yeah, just to start, it is uh, generally understood that the origins of the open access movement can be traced back to the desire to share, to freely share research output. There's very little contestation to the fact that the primary purpose of the research produced is to provide solutions to the challenges that beset society. Hence, it is my assertion that open access movement, that the open access movement should be underpinned by philanthropic principles. That is the desire 
to share research to address societal challenges. However, from the outset, from the Budapest to the Bethesda to the Berlin Declaration to date, there has been no explicit articulation that open access contributes to socioeconomic development. For whatever reason, this void seems to escape the acknowledgement by open access proponents. For those from the global south, open access is about development. It is about social economic development. It is about research development. I'm not in any way suggesting that the omission of social economic development is done by design. I'm not in any way suggesting that marginalization of the global south is done by design. The architects of the open access movement were constrained. They were constrained by working through a solitary global north lens. For the architects, the principle of open access is to facilitate free access to research for the production of new research. For Africa, and I'm assuming for the better part of the global south, the foundational layer is access to information, but it is access to information to stimulate growth and development. It is access to information to support social uh, economic development. The layer on top of this foundational layer is the research agenda, that is access to research for the growth of new research. It is my argument that the world's research agenda is dictated to by the needs of the global North, who are also, and admittedly, the primary funders of research and the primary uh, purchasers of that research. It is unfortunate, but a reality. Global South research is the casualty it is the casualty of a research agenda that is constructed by the global north. The principles of inclusivity seem to have been bypassed by the world's current research agenda. The focus of this presentation is on the global south, reimagining fit for purpose open access practices. It is about Africa finding solutions to deconstruct, to deconstruct the world's single lens research agenda, agenda and to reconstruct African research practices with commensurate modes of distribution of the research output. It is about inserting inclusivity as a golden thread in open access. The prefix D, DE, plays a significant role for the open access movement in the global south. In Africa, the transposition of territorial colonialism with knowledge colonialism demands the re-engineering of the critical pillars of, open access, of the open access movement to eradicate subjugation. For Africa, there is a dire need to bring to the fore the philanthropic underpinning of the open access movement and to recast the open access movement to advance socioeconomic development through active participation in the world's knowledge pool. I've mentioned the issue of deconstructing the global North research agenda in deconstructing the Global North research agenda, there is going to be a reliance on the denorthernization of the publishing landscape, which will, have, which will have the dominant effect of demarginalizing Global South research and researchers. The publishing of local content will contribute to fulfilling the demand for a decolonized scholarly content 
and the democratization of scholarly content. The DE prefix, the DE prefix road will also contribute to the reversal of knowledge colonialism. For those in the global south, open access is more than just sharing of the research output. It is an opportunity to embed the principles of inclusivity. The path or the connector between the D prefix and an inclusive open access system is social justice. The concepts of Ubuntu and social justice are bastions of the openness movement in Africa. As much as African librarians have not openly declared the support for Ubuntu or social justice, they have for many years championed the societal value, the societal value of openly making available scholarly information. Social justice is viewed as a system that confronts structures that perpetuate poverty and injustice through the eradication of information poverty and injustice. And open access is the conduit used for this eradication. Inclusivity is at the core, is at the epicenter of social justice. Social justice advances the redistribution of resources to improve the circumstances of the disadvantaged. Ubuntu is a Zulu word which encourages communal justice en route to promoting an egalitarian society. Ubuntu advocates posit that information poverty is a community's inability not only to access essential information, but also to benefit from it in order to meet their basic, their absolute basic needs for survival and development. Ubuntu as a concept is underpinned by a sense of community. You are who you are because of your interaction with the community around you. If the community thrives, you will thrive. This is what open access should be about. This is what it should be about. Inclus inclusivity also breaks down subjugation. Inclusivity stimulates liberation and upholds democracy. Access to information is essential for the dismantling of explicit and or unintended knowledge colonialism. Given the myriad of challenges stifling access, Open access is more than just redressing the research agenda. It has to become a way of life for Africans. And sharing is at the epicenter of Ubuntu. One does not have to be a rocket scientist to see the mirroring of open access in Ubuntu. Territorial colonialism may have ended some time ago, but it has been replaced with knowledge colonialism. Pinay and Leon Hemelstein confirms that prejudice, uh, confirms this, this prejudice when they state that the needs uh, that, that Global South researchers need to navigate. They make the point that researchers from, researchers from the Global South, uh, sorry, researchers from the Global South usually lead research projects, while Global South partners are invited to join. Here is another bias or prejudice. As leaders of projects, Global North region, uh, researchers select research partners from the Global South, but they select researchers who are well-known and, and who speak good English, who have, or who have studied at Global North University. This practice leaves behind partners who only speak the local language. 
or unless known, but may have very, very strong local knowledge. This management of knowledge is succinctly captured by Boyce, who points out that if the world was mapped according to how many scientific research papers each country produced, it would take on a rather bizarre appearance. The global north would balloon beyond recognition. The global south, including Africa, would effectively melt off the map. This extremely bloated size of the United States and Europe compared to global South countries clearly demonstrates, it clearly shows the global knowledge imbalance. This imbalance means that research findings are drawn primarily from the United States and Europe. This concentration of dissemination of Western knowledge to the global south is exacerbated by the imposition of ways of knowing, knowledge production, and theoretical thinking. There is acknowledgement of both explicit and unintended knowledge colonialism. But the question is, what is the way forward? The one proposal is the denorthernizing or the denorthernization of the publishing landscape. And this will contribute to addressing the issue of inclusivity, the issue of demarginalization, the issue of decoloniality. In pursuit of maximum profits, major publishing houses have inadvertently northernized the publishing landscape. The unintended but systematic northernization of the publishing landscape has marginalized the research voices from the global south. There is a desperate need for the democratization and the denorthernization of the publishing landscape. There is a need for a publishing process that promotes social justice and the inclusion of, re of African researchers and research output into mainstream research processes. There is a desperate need to grow the scholarly pool of decolonized content for the eradication of knowledge colonialism. There are several interventions that can, that can contribute to a decolonized agenda. I speak as a librarian. The intervention that we have control of is the rollout of a library publishing service. The offer of a library publishing service driven by social justice imperatives will help reshape. It will help reimagine the publishing landscape and positively impact on the inclusion of marginalized African research voices. Further, African society, society itself, will have access to local content to address local challenges. I would like to take what I've been speaking of and convert that into a service model. I'm going to use the example of UCT libraries to demonstrate the translation of social justice into practice to translate the principles of inclusivity into practice, to convert the commitment to a decolonized education, to convert that into practice, to translate demarginalization into action. I need to state categorically that UCT libraries has not found a complete solution but we try to innovate all the time, giving attention to the deep prefix of open access. What I would like to give attention to is UCT's monograph publishing. There are a number of libraries in South Africa and Africa that are engaging in journal publishing. However, UCT 
The University of Cape Town has made the conscious decision to focus on book publication. This route taken is, in, is intended to address, amongst others, the issues of inclusivity, decolonization, and the democratization of information resources. The, the, the UCT exemplar illustrates how a library publishing service can provide students with opportunity to stay in the education system, graduate, and ultimately contribute to the growth and development of society. Here, inclusivity is about giving opportunity to the poor and the previously disadvantaged. This publisher service, which started in 2016, has published, has thus far, thus far published 14 books and publishes five journals. One of those 14 books published is the constitutional law for students. Constitutional law is considered one of the more complex subjects in the law degree in South Africa. Given the complexity of the course and the lack of appropriate support information resources, the failure rate is very high. It's extremely high. The prescribed textbooks are far too expensive and students try to get by without purchasing these prescribed textbooks, much to their detriment. Further, a large cohort of students are second language or later English speakers who have challenges navigating the dense legal content. To address this challenge, the book has an audio format which allows students to listen before reading. The added feature to the book makes the book more inclusive as it caters for different learning styles. Embedded in the book are many workbooks to help students prepare for the constitutional law examination. I know there will be lots of criticisms about the purpose of education, but I am looking at the, the principle of student success in terms of throughput. Given that smartphones are more readily available than computers, Content can be viewed in HTML or EPUB format, providing wider accessibility across the country. And this I will show in the graphic below. That is the constitutional law textbook. And as you could see, can see from the graphic, in the months of September, October, November, this is examination preparation time the downloads have shot through the ceiling. We're looking at around about 6,000 downloads. And these are downloads that most of the students would never have accessed before. I would like to go back and look at the association of the D prefix and the constitutional law textbook. Let's start with the principle of democratization of information. This book is freely accessible to all, and that includes the general citizens of the country. The principles of inclusivity underpins this, this, this publication. It is free. It is accessible in audio format for the visually challenged. It is an audio format that supports alternative modes of learning. And it is in a technical format that facilitates automated translation into other languages. That the, the fact that the book is as inclusive as mentioned addresses the issue of demarginalization. The subject matter of the textbook by default would address the issue of decolonization. Be that as it may, this is a textbook 
written by students, for students, under the BDI of a mentor. The book gives young prospective academics the opportunity to share the knowledge via a publication on an open platform. Here we are looking at the development of the next generation of academics, hopefully academics that have a social conscience. There is a trend for South African legal monographs to be published by Global North University Presses. The assumption is that the association with leading university presses adds prestige to the book. The fact that this book, this constitutional law textbook is published locally addresses the issue of denorganization. And hopefully this misnomer will be dispelled because we publish for it to be read, not to look pretty. An analysis of the downloads show that the book is being used across the country. Unfortunately, we cannot tell whether members of the public are accessing the book, but be that as it may, the downloads analysis show the students are using the book. And it is our hope as a library that it will contribute to student success. There are many challenges that the Global South needs to address in transitioning from being a marginalized research community to being an included one. There has to be a deliberate strategy to deconstruct the current dominant exclusionary research landscape and reconstruct a fit for purpose landscape that is driven by social justice. The exemplar of UCT libraries demonstrates the capabilities. It demonstrates the capabilities of exploiting the deprefix strategy to leverage a denorganized, demarginalized, decolonized research landscape en route to the democratization of information. Open access in Africa must be synonymous with inclusion. The golden inclusivity thread can and must be weaved into the fabric of open access. Thank you very much for your time. Reggie, thank you very much for, um, for sharing your, your presentation with us today. Um, what I'm going to do um, is we are going to, um, to move on to the, the next speaker and then take questions for, for both speakers together um, after, um, after the next presentation. Um, so, Lucy Abelard Dorner is um, said is after I'll just as a quick introduction um, has a PhD in immunology and spent five years managing the Immunity and Infection Immunophenotyping Consortium, which is an open access project at King's College London. Um, she then moved to Oxford, where she now works as a scientific manager at the Big Data Institute, managing the Pangaea HIV Consortium and contributing to work on COVID-19 in the Fraser Group. So welcome Lucy and also thank you for speaking today. So I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. And your slides look clear. Okay. Fantastic. Um, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, I'm going to share another open, uh, open access, open source success story with you from quite a different area. Um, I'm going to talk about open ABM COVID-19, which is a mathematical model to simulate the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, don't worry, there won't be any formulas, um, just graphs. And um, yeah, well, I hope that um, by the end of this talk, uh, I'll have convinced you that um, the model actually had a positive impact on the pandemic, um, in, at least in the UK. And um, yeah, it would be fantastic to have a discussion about how we can replicate this success story. 
uh, it's obviously there's lots of people involved. Um, you can see the whole Fraser group here. Uh, there were also many collaborators and I'm going to come back to them in the talk. I'd like to point out in particular Christoph Fraser, who is the PI of the group, um, um, circled uh, on the left and then Will Probert in the middle and uh, Robert Hinge on top, uh, who were the main developers uh, of this model. So the talk is going to have three sections. The first one is what is a open ABM COVID-19 and I'm going to tell you a little about a little bit about the model. Um, the second one is how it became open source and uh, and how it became a success by being open source. And then the third section is an outlook and uh, discussing the question whether this is a success that can be replicated in the future. So how did it all start? Um, at the beginning of the epidemic, when, when quite a few people were thinking, oh, okay, there's nothing really that we can do um, it's just going to race over the planet and everybody's going to get infected and we'll have to do with the fallout. Um, my boss, Christopher Fraser, and, and sort of the whole group, um, we came to the conclusion that actually that's not the case. And then when you look at the, math, the maths behind it and the epidemiology, um, everything suggests that it can be stopped. And it can be stopped uh, if you use um, very fast and very efficient contact tracing. And uh, for example, with a contact tracing app, which is now implemented in many, many countries. And um, I think that and that uh, paper was published in Science early on in March. And I think that really struck a chord and I'm going to come back to that. Um, the Science paper used also used a mathematical model, but it used a model where only groups were modeled. So you have susceptible individuals and then you have infected individuals and you have individuals who are recovered. Um, but if you want to uh, look at um, interventions against COVID-19, in this case, non-pharmaceutical interventions like lockdowns or contact tracing um, or self-isolation. Um, so lockdown is obviously that concerns a whole population. But if you think about contact tracing, you really want to look at individuals. So what was needed was a much more granular model. You needed a mathematical model that can simulate individual people in a population. So um, as you can imagine, that is much, much more, a much, much more complex model than just um, looking at groups. Um, if you have the, the model where, which looks at groups, you can quite often write that down in a few equations, but that's not the case with a model that um, simulates individual people. Fortunately, um, we already had such a model and um, this was called Popart IBM. And this is an individual based model um, and it was developed to model the spread of HIV in Zambia and in South Africa. Um, uh, we have long term collaborators in both places and um, Popart was one of the um, one of the largest uh, universal test and treat trials, uh, HIV trials in the history of HIV research and this was the mathematical, mathematical model that was developed for it. And it was developed to, um, to simulate the whole HIV, the whole global HIV epidemic from 1900 onwards. So it was able to deal um, with, uh, with many, many individuals. Um, and the, the trial area, as I said, it was a very big trial comprised about a million people. So um, we put the two together and created, um, based on this framework that we had for the HIV model, we created open ABM COVID-19, which is um, a model that's specific for COVID and uh, that can follow sort of individual people throughout the epidemic and, um, and see how their behavior, how their contacts uh, are affected by national lockdowns, but also by maybe uh, self-isolation upon symptoms or, um, or instructions to quarantine after having been in contact with an infectious person. Um, so open ABM COVID-19, as I said, is an individual based model and it simulates the spread of COVID-19 in a population of approximately 1 million people, which is about the population in the UK uh, that one hospital, um, one large hospital is supposed to take care of. Um, it has uh, different inputs. So you have to, it, it needs certain information. It needs the demographic of the country. It needs um, a network structure. 
Um, it also needs uh, disease parameters. So parameters, uh, biological parameters from COVID-19 um, about the infection and how it is transmitted. And it can also be used, as I said, to simulate non-pharmaceutical interventions like lockdowns, household isolation, testing, and in particular contact tracing. And it can also be used to help predict which impact these different measures will have on a population uh, when they are used uh, alone or in combination. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure, um, just to give you a sense of what the model looks like, and also to explain um, why it was maybe uh, why it was well suited to become an open um, source model. So um, it has certain demographic parameters. Uh, and that's, for example, how old are people? How many people do you have that are between zero and nine years, 10 and 19 years, and so on? And um, in, we use the data for the UK population. Um, but if you have this data for other countries, you can easily adopt the model for other countries. And in fact, we've started to do that with our collaborators in Zambia um, to look at the Zambian COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, you also need a sense of how large households are and what the age distribution is in these households. Um, and we also took um, a measure of daily interactions that people tend to have from a large social sur survey that was uh, conducted a few years ago in the UK. And um, what you end up with is something like the graph on the right, uh, where you can see that different age groups have different daily interactions. Um, it averaged out to seven, between seven and 15, depending on age. So um, older people have, tend to have fewer daily connections. Um, adults have connections um, uh, uh, in, the, in the household, in the workplace, and then children obviously have connections at school. And that actually leads us into um, the network structure of the model. Um, so you have, you've, you've got different kinds of contacts. So you have contacts in the household, which are very close, um, especially obviously in the winter months. So these are people you meet again and again and, and whom you see for several hours a day, um, which obviously has an impact on the likelihood of COVID-19 transmission. Um, you also have the workplace networks where you tend to meet the same people um, again and again, but uh, maybe you don't see all your colleagues every day. So as you can see in this graph, um, whereas the household networks stay the same on, on, on at each given day, the occupation networks change slightly. Or ra rather, I mean, you have sort of the same, you you've, got the, you've got contact with the same colleagues, but not necessarily to each colleague every day. And then you also have random contacts, like the people you meet in public transport, um, while being in the supermarket and these change daily and it's just sort of a random selection of, of people that you might meet on the street. Obviously the model also needs biological input so um, we took all the papers that we could find uh, um, at the beginning of March, most of them were for chi from China at the time but we've also since updated them uh, from uh, publications from other places um, to make sure we are sort of as inclusive as possible and, and take into account all the variety of data that's coming from different places. Um, and um, the model needs some sense of when people are infectious, which is still a very uh, important question these days, like how long should you stay at home if you have been infected? When do you stop being infectious? That's still being discussed. Um, and also who's gonna get severe disease and who's only gonna get mild disease or asymptomatic disease as a matter. And in the model uh, that very much depends on age. So we assume that children in general as has also been published uh, tend to be not very susceptible and get mild disease. Whereas um, older people um, are more susceptible. They catch COVID-19 easier than children and adults of working age. Um, and they tend to have more severe disease. If you take all of that together, the demographics that you have, um, the network structures that you have, the household structure, um, the biological parameters of COVID-19, which form the infection model, you arrive at something like a transmission pattern. And um, the legends are probably a bit small uh, on this small screen, but basically what you can see is on the 
on the on the horizontal x-axis you see the age of the um, uh, infected person and on the uh, y-axis you see the age of the person who was infected and passes on the infection and you can see that um, there is a lot of infection uh, going on in the elderly because uh, they are both highly susceptible and highly infectious when they have severe disease and um, and there's also quite a lot going on in in uh, in young people uh, sort of secondary school and early university that's the disease part you also have the hospital part so how does the health system deal with the disease um, so you have people with uh, who don't have any symptoms at all you have mild symptoms you have severe symptoms um, and some of these people will get hospitalized. Um, some of them will proceed um, uh, to the intensive care unit. Uh, and then most of them will recover, but unfortunately, obviously, some of them will die. And in the model, as in reality, the deaths are highly skewed towards um, the elderly. Um, and then you can start playing around with it. You can uh, look, at, look, look at lockdowns, and you can see here that if you impose a lockdown, the, the household contacts stay mostly the same, but all the other contacts um, uh, are reduced quite a bit. And um, you can model interventions and see, for example, here, if you introduce a contact, contact, contact tracing app, um, how the daily cases will go down the more people use the app. So taken together, it's a model which has several advantages. Um, it has this network structure and it can follow individual people. It's also computationally very fast, which is important if you want to simulate a large number of people there. And in March, there were several other models um, who could do all the other things, but um, they could only simulate very few people. Um, it's also modular and it was open source from the beginning. And it had a testing framework that, which means that if you contribute new code, um, you have the ability to test whether your code is correct and whether it works well with the existing code, uh, which is really important to keep an open source model running because otherwise people contribute uh, code and, and they might break other things or not work well with other things and then it soon becomes a mess. And it was also bespoke for COVID-19, um, I guess, because the model was originally an HIV model. We had to recode quite a lot to make it um, uh, fit for purpose for a respiratory illness. Some of the other models were adjusted from flu and they sort of retained some of the flu biology in them. So we'd had, we had to do that from scratch. So it was really bespoke. So how did this end up being an open source story? So as I said, at the beginning, there was a science article and the HIV model and became open ABM COVID-19. But the science article really struck a chord and, um, and we were contacted by several people. So first of all, we were contacted by IBM UK who offered help free of charge and, um, and contributed to the model. And I'll come back to that later. Um, we also started a collaboration with uh, NHSX, so the digital part of the English um, National Health Service um, to develop a contact tracing app. They in turn had contact with a company called Faculty AI, who at the time was what had a contract with the National Health Service in England. And they had been looking for a model that can do many of these things and that can in particular help predict hospital capacity. So they decided that um, they wanted to use our model. So they put in a lot of effort to um, to, doc to document the code, which means sort of explain what the different parts of the codes were doing, which is really, really important in making it accessible to other coders. Because, um, I mean, this is, we're talking about maybe 20,000 lines of code here. So if you don't have an indication of what is happening in this code, it's really, really difficult to, get to, co to contribute to it in a meaningful way. They were also in touch with Goldman Sachs, who wanted to use the model to look at different industries and with the group at the Francis Crick Institutes who were also in touch with NHS England to code um, uh, um, a model for hospitals. Um, at some point later on, uh, those of you who are in the UK might remember that um, the UK switched to a contact tracing app operated by the Google and Apple system. We had had, we had been in contact with Google before, um, 
But uh, at this point in time, Google got also interested in the simulation because it was a very good model for the UK epidemic. And they contributed to the model and also um, recorded the model with some other elements um, to, make it, um, to make it run faster on parallel computers. So now it's used uh, in England and Wales to predict hospital capacity. Uh, in Oxford, we use it to advise the Department of Health on COVID-19 apps. Um, Google used their recorded version of open ABM COVID-19 uh, ABE SIM uh, to, to sort of back up their uh, rollout of contact tracing apps across the world. And several other groups across the world also downloaded it and are using it for their own purposes, but haven't so far contributed to the code. So why did it become a success and was used by all these people and important players? And I mean, there was an element of stars aligning. So there was, several, there was the model itself, and um, I've talked about the advantages that it had compared to other models at that point in time, so sort of early on in the epidemic, in the UK epidemic, March, April. And then the science paper really struck a chord with the positive message that actually, yes, we, we can be proactive and we can get this epidemic under control um, if we just pick the right tools. Um, the, the fact that faculty decided that this was the best model, the best academic model that they could find at that point in time, and that they wanted to take it further and that they added all the documentation. Um, the free help from IBM UK it was sort of really, we got lots of offers for help. It was like everybody rallying together in the face of an epidemic uh, and, and also the partnership with Google, which continues to this day. And if you look at what the other parties contributed, you can actually see that there were some scientific contributions, but a lot of the contributions actually concerned um, accessibility. And that is both accessibility uh, for contributors to the model, for other coders, um, the team in Oxford uh, um, enlarged the testing framework to make sure that all the contributions worked well with the existing model and that if, if there were some incomp incompatibilities, they could quickly be found and corrected. Um, faculty did all the hard uh, work and, and frankly also slightly boring work of, of documenting the code and explaining to other coders what was happening in the different modules of the, of the model. So, um, so that people could easily get a sense of like which parts of the model were coded where and how they could best contribute specific modules to this model. And um, then Google recorded the model in C++, um, which is faster, uh, on, can be used on a parallel um, interface. And they also chose a slightly different uh, license, which is more permissible. And then there was also an improvement for uh, users. Um, so our team in Oxford, Oxford developed Jupyter Notebooks, which are a way um, um, to access the model and, and get output from the model without having to know the coding language C, which not, not that many people know. And IBM um, contributed a Python interface, which is another coding language. And Google is currently contributing an R interface, which is another coding language, which means that um, different people from different fields uh, can access the model and run the model, not necessarily contribute to the model, but use the model, use the model output in the language that they are most familiar with. So can we replicate the success? Can we keep the stars aligned for future projects? Um, so it's, it's actually quite difficult. And um, a very good um, paper on this topic appeared in PLOS um, Biology a month ago um, by Adam Kutarski and colleagues. Um, and they point out that, um, that traditional academic reward structures and metrics um, do not reflect the contributions of science to the epidemic that we've seen. So for example, all the work that the companies did for us, we couldn't have pulled that off probably because we, we don't have the manpower. Um, postdocs need to think about their publications. Uh, and it's, it's really a lot of work to, uh, to maintain open source, uh, open source code, to, uh, to make sure all the contributions are linked with the main code and so on. Um, funders don't necessarily um, uh, provide you with money to keep um, 
software running that has been developed um, during the project. Um, so so it, it, it's, it is difficult. Um, also, um, we the, the model has very has a GNU general public license, which is quite restrictive in how it can be used. So, for example, it requires all um, all software that is developed um, on top of it to have the same very open license. Um, the, the, the reason we had to do this was because some of the software, some of the packages and software packages that we were using for the model had this license and required uh, this license to be used again. Uh, but it also means that it is uh, less useful for, uh, for commercial enterprise, for example. And it is maybe noteworthy that um, when Google recorded the model, uh, they used a slightly different license in which, in which this, this part is missing. However, it's called Open ABM COVID-19 for a reason. It's not called COVID-19 Open ABM. And the idea behind the name really is that um, we now that the hard work is done um, with the documentation of the code and with all the interfaces, all these uh, contributions to accessibility, um, that in the future, with the help of others and obviously open source, uh, we can develop a whole family of open ABM models because the way the code is structured, um, uh, it can be easily, um, well, I mean, easily, it's still a lot of work, but, um, but it is possible to adjust it reasonably quickly for other infectious diseases. So you can imagine that hopefully in a few years time, there will be open ABM COVID-19 and open ABM HIV and open ABM influenza and open ABM tuberculosis. So, so that's the vision, that's the hope that, um, that we have right now. And with that thought, I'll end and show the acknowledgement slide again. Uh, again, acknowledge the collaborators um, that I've also mentioned throughout the talk, IBM faculty, Google Research, uh, the team at the Francis Crick Institute, um, NHSX. And if you would like to know more, we have a group web page on coronavirus, which is um, at the bottom. And we also have a group web page which sort of shows more about what we're doing, um, the work we're doing on coronavirus, but also on HIV. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Lucy, thank you very much. That was really interesting. We've we've kind of been um, we've been in recent conversations about GNU licenses at Crossref. So that that resonates. Um, and also as said that the use of um, Jupyter notebooks, which are super helpful in a lot of work that that we do as well. Um, I think we've got a couple of minutes for, for questions um, before we go into the next session, um, either for Lucy or for, um, or for Reggie, um, which you can ask us that either in the Q&A window or in the, in the chats. Um, I, I might take sort of, Personal, pr um, Sarah, do you have a question or do you want? Um, go ahead. Um, I've got a really quick question for um, for Reggie. I'm going to take the privilege to, to ask. Um, I was wondering a bit, you know, because you've given the, the example of um, UC, UCT um, and one of the questions that often comes up around sort of library publishing or in, you know, in university sort of publishing houses is how much support you have from the institution. And if you're seeing the, um, because I know you work with um, libraries in other, um, in other countries in Africa, if you're seeing sort of similar um, trends elsewhere. Uh, no, no, I don't think, I think, uh, there are multiple um, challenges in terms of uh, fast tracking um, uh, the libraries and publishers service. Um, and I think we at UCT are in a fortunate position in that we have the infrastructure, we have the capacity, we have the capabilities, and we're hoping that that will filter across the continent at the least. Um, but there is a trend within South Africa uh, for other libraries to, to take on this, this challenge. And I think the general feel across South Africa 
is that the library as a publisher service becomes part of your core suite of services that you deliver as an academic library. So I'm quite optimistic about this becoming a mainstream service um, for Global South academic libraries. So yeah, I mean, I can't answer the question in any more detail than that, but just to hope that it does gain more traction. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Cool, thank you. I, yeah, am I muted? No, I'm not muted, good. Nope, you're fine. I had a question for Lucy. <laughs> um, in regards to the um, development of the model as it currently stands, um, how much in terms of because I'm assuming you had lots of da different data coming in from different parts of the world as different parts went through different things that could then feed into that model how much did the model actually change uh, was there a point in time when it dramatically changed that then, then meant that that information was being shipped out to make for people to make decisions or uh, was it more gradual over the past nine months um I mean, we, we sort of try to keep on track of scientific literature and um, and update the model um, as we went. Um, there was there were a few occasions where um, the model changed um, because uh, more dramatically, for example, um, maybe you, I mean, that was also on the main news, the question of how many people do actually have symptoms. And um, in, in the beginning, um, uh, the, the people's sort of early publications said it's, it's maybe around 16%, but they were always looking at sort of contact tracing data where people actually had symptoms and then they were looking at the contacts and so on, um, and, and maybe including more severe cases. And um, in England at some point, um, and also in other countries, they started to just randomly test people and it seemed that many more people didn't have symptoms. And um, so we updated that in the model, and that actually has a huge impact for for lots of um, for lots of interventions because if people don't have symptoms, they can't stay at home and self isolate. Um, so they're still running around infecting other people, and um, they also won't get a test. So there will be no contact tracing from these people. So there were a few occasions where new data changed the output um, of the model, but overall um, to the observer it's probably more a gradual uh, development okay thanks um what i think we should do i know that we're um we scheduled a quick sort of five ten minute break before the before the the next panel so I, i'm gonna I'm going to give all of your um, give all of your screens and all of your eyes a break. Um, so if you want to take a five minute break, and um, we'll meet back at ten past for the for the next session. But again, I'd like to reiterate our thanks to to Lucy and Reggie for two um, really fantastic um, opening opening talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Thank you. Welcome back to the second session, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure first up to, to introduce Iriche. Uh, she's the Associate Director for ASAP Bio, which is a nonprofit with a mission to accelerate innovation and transparency in life science communication. In her role, she works to foster awareness of preprints and drive community engagement. Uh, she also coordinates the ASAP Bio Fellows Program. And prior to her work with ASAP Bio, Iroche worked in publishing for 16 years, including editorial roles with open access publishers, including Biomed Central and PLOS, where she was a deputy editor in chief of PLOS One. Uh, Iroche also is the facilitation and integrity officer for the Committee on Publication Ethics. And she's already ready to go. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the introduction um, and for the invitation to be here today. Thank you to Crossref and to the Woodland uh, Libraries. Um, 
Right, so um, as Sarah nicely pointed out, I'm Irachapul, Associate Director uh, for Ace of Bio. I'm going to be speaking a little bit about preprints and what has happened this year um, in data space in the context of the pandemic. And I'm going to also be uh, telling you a little bit about the efforts that Ace of Bio has made in terms of community engagement, again, as the pandemic was evolving this year. So for anyone in the audience who may not be familiar with ASAP Bio, we're a small non-for-profit uh, organization um, with a mission to promote innovation and transparency in life sciences communication. We have two main areas of focus. The first relates to the adoption of preprints, and I'll be speaking about that in a second. And the second relates to um, initiatives to support further transparency in peer review. So in the context of our support for preprint adoption, this, uh, this has been a focus of ASA Bio since it was established a few years ago. And we take a number of initiatives to try to, again, encourage the use and engagement with preprints. Um, we have driven a number of projects looking at different areas of preprint usage, uh, trying to uh, get together with the stakeholders, as part of meetings and, and again, different projects to try to get their ideas together, um, see what the challenges may be for different communities in terms of using preprints and what the solutions to those challenges may be. We have also uh, had an Ace of Bio community for a few years now. It was previously called Ace of Bio Ambassador. So I mentioned this in case you were more familiar with that terminology. Um, we have renamed that group the Ace of Bio community, and again, I'm going to be speaking about, about that fantastic group a, a bit more uh, later. Um, another important area for us uh, is that we try to develop resources on any aspects related to preprints um, to provide, again, tools and information to researchers who may want to understand a bit more as to what preprints uh, may mean for them or if they want to speak to their colleagues about them. Um, and we also uh, track resources that hopefully are useful to other stakeholders in this space. Uh, for example, we host a preprint server directory and we have been tracking adoption of preprints in the biomedical sciences over time. So we have a track record of supporting preprints um, for a number of years. Uh, and we were happy to see that there was uh, increasing adoption uh, of them for life sciences communication. But it is fair to say that um, up to quite recently, uh, preprinting was still a bit of a minority practice, especially if we consider uh, the volume of publications in biomedical uh, sciences. If we if we count the number of uh, articles published compared to preprints, preprints accounted for around three three percent last year. So it was a relatively again minority activity. And then we had this year arrive with all of the crazy things that happened. Um, and we saw a, a quite a shift in terms of the use of preprints because obviously uh, as the outbreak was expanding across the globe, there was a pressing need for disseminating the latest data and find it rapidly so that researchers, and again, those treating patients, et cetera, and, and even in terms of uh, societal um, behavior uh, measures, it was important to have access to the latest information as quickly as possible to address the crisis. And what we have seen in that context is that many researchers then uh, rapidly adopted preprints as a means of disseminating their latest research and, and their findings. Um, what I'm showing here is a couple of, of graphs from uh, an analysis of COVID-19 preprints in the initial months of the pandemic. So this covers up to the end of April. And as you can see on the top uh, graph, uh, this shows the number of uh, reports that were coming out in the form of a preprint and those that were coming out in journal articles. And as you can see, for example, in April, there was a substantial proportion of, uh, of results and reports that were coming out uh, uh, in preprint format. So this was a substantial shift versus the, again, 3% uh, proportion that I was mentioning, uh, for example, just in comparison uh, with last year. In parallel to this, what we saw is that obviously there was a, a major interest in, um, in having access to, to the latest results. Everyone wanted to keep up to date with the, with the findings. 
And again, this, these are graphs on the left from the same analysis of COVID-19 uh, 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 preprints. The, what we saw was increased attention to the findings that were reported in that format. Um, the analysis here shows a comparison between the attention in terms of citations, tweets, and even news articles for the group of preprints reporting on COVID-19 uh, findings and a group of uh, preprints posted in the same, same period, but not, re not related to the pandemic. And as you can see, there was a substantial additional attention for the preprints focused on, on COVID-19. Um, in parallel to this, um, what, what we saw happening was that while traditionally preprints were a means for researchers to communicate their latest finding to each other and to foster that interaction and dialogue, as given, given the major impact of the pandemic this year, we saw research reported in preprints actually coming out uh, as part of media stories in, uh, in, the, in the mainstream uh, media. And, and then again, those results were being uh, made accessible to the public, um, which was for, for those of us who have been uh, uh, following and working in, in, in the space of, of preprints, for a while, a bit of a mixed blessing because it was an opportunity to educate many researchers and other non-specialists about the value of preprints. But at the same time, there was this uh, challenge around the fact that for many uh, among the public, um, it may not be clear how the scientific process operates and it, the, the iterative nature of uh, scientific progress and that it, probably the, the public was not able to necessarily always um, uh, differentiate what was coming out as a preliminary uh, set of results in, in the format of a preprint that has not been peer reviewed versus the standard publication part in a peer reviewed uh, journal. So in that context, uh, and uh, something that we saw um, developing in parallel, which I think has been a very uh, interesting uh, trend, is that there was also interest in providing further uh, contextualization for uh, all of these papers that were coming out as a means of, again, providing further, further context as to whether there was perhaps some limitations to consider, um, and also as a means of curating all of this uh, big volume of papers that was coming out, even in the format of preprints. So there have been a number of initiatives um, this year uh, in different formats, but all focus on, again, trying to go through the latest COVID-19 preprints and providing some commentary uh, and evaluation for those. Um, I'm a particularly interested, personally, all of them are great, but I, I follow uh, very closely the ones related to journal clubs, um, because there's been quite a, a nice, uh, uh, interesting activities by groups of students, uh, for example, in Mount Sinai, and at the University of Oxford, uh, where students have uh, voluntarily come together and tried to go through the different uh, latest immunology preprints related to COVID-19, and again, trying to curate that for readers and posting their comments publicly so that it was available to others. In parallel to all those initiatives, there, there have been others. Uh, Outbreak Science uh, Rapid Pre Review is a platform that was already operating that allows users to submit um, rapid structure reactions and reviews on preprints. So, again, it was already operating, but obviously, it has been particularly timely in the context of the, of the pandemic this year. Um, and another uh, interesting development, again, not a new concept, but something that we have uh, seen getting more attention this year, um, relates to the use of overlay journals, which are journals that actually do not publish content, but what they do is go and check over existing content available in an open format. So again, preprints are um, a very clear uh, pool of content for them. Uh, and what the overlay journal will do is coordinate reviews for that content that is already available. Um, the Rapid Reviews COVID-19 uh, overlay journal was launched this year, again, with a specific focus to coordinate reviews for the COVID-19 preprints that were coming out um, and trying to develop quality reviews that, again, would be made available for readers interested in the, in the preprint and that would provide that further um, rich contextualization of the work. So in, as, while all of that was happening, 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, at Ace of Bio, we have a, 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 an interest in supporting the community with resources uh, around preprints that they can use again in, in their own work or in conversations with others. And one of the things that we developed early on was to prepare a dedicated page on our website with a number of resources around preprints and not only preprints, but also other means of rapid communication of COVID-19 research. This was to help researchers keep up to date with how to find the different reports, um, different initiatives, again, that may not necessarily relate to preference, but to sharing perhaps data or other materials. Um, and we also added specifically a section on, again, this review commentary and, and, and curation of COVID-19 preprints with all of the um, curation and review efforts that I just um, covered. Something else that we thought uh, needed some attention in, in the context of the use of preprints uh, was to try to develop some um, resources and tools for researchers and other stakeholders to try to navigate that issue of the fact that preprints were uh, being covered in the media much more than ever before. Um, and to, again, try to equip them to handle situations where research may be potentially not, not accurately reported in, in news stories, not necessarily consciously, but journalists often um, work to very tight timelines. So trying to, to provide some um, concrete and practical tools for the different stakeholders as they were um, operating in that and, and, and promoting work that may have appeared as a preprint. So we started this project called Preprints in the Public Eye, which is still ongoing, and it has three areas of focus. The first relates to the labeling of preprints. So essentially, when you come to a preprint record, uh, what are the information or labels that maybe uh, may, may give you some information that is very clear? Uh, and, and quick in terms of uh, um, providing clarity as to the fact that the paper has not been peer reviewed. And again, it differs from, from a journal article. The second area of focus relates to uh, tools for and principles for researchers as they may be interacting with the media in relation to their own research. And the third, again, looking at the other stakeholder that is particularly important in this context. The journalist trying to develop some resources and build on the existing resources that others had um, already put forward to again support them in uh, responsibly and accurately reporting work, um, the late uh, work, work in, in, in research fields, again, related to preprints or, or perhaps it, even if it has been reported in another format. I'm very happy to say that the outcomes from the input of the of those who have worked in the three areas of focus have now been posted publicly for community input. So I provided the link there. I encourage everyone to have a look. Um, and please feel free to share feedback. We have a, a feedback form available, or you're free to obviously um, contact any of us at ASAP Bio, and we'd be happy to discuss with you. The other area that we have been thinking about quite a bit in addition to providing resources and on, on working on specific projects is, as I mentioned, we've always had an interest in, in community engagement. Um, but as the year was evolving, we, we took an opportunity to really take a step back and really rethink a little bit how we were engaging with the community. And obviously, as many other organizations, we also had to um, adjust to the fact that well, we all moved to an online world um, and, and trying to find different ways of interacting with our community members. So we took a number of uh, approaches to this, and I wanted to share a few of the initiatives that we have put in place over the last six months or so. Um, a couple of the uh, recent efforts related to preprint review. Um, I've mentioned earlier this increased interest around the curation and review of preprints. And this is something that we as a buyer uh, feel quite strongly about and are very supportive of because we think that this is an activity that is very valuable for researchers, but also increases the credibility and again, the, the potential uh, engagement and use of, of, pre of preprints as valid research outputs. So one of the uh, things that we did was that we, we thought that if we wanted to encourage preprint review, maybe we should lead by example and just do preprint reviews. So we hosted an event a couple of months ago 
that was essentially just focused on uh, review and preprints. Um, and we were very happy to have over 60 participants who work in, in groups. Uh, collaboratively developing uh, reviews for preprints uh, that they had chosen or, or that we had suggested. Um, and they work together on that, which was also a training opportunity and develop a number of preprint reviews that again, we posted publicly so that they could be available to anyone coming to those papers. A second area of focus around uh, preprint review is that we were familiar with a number of activities in this space, again, some that were ongoing, some that may have been new related to COVID-19. Um, and we thought that it would be a good opportunity to get everyone together uh, so that we all got a nice overview of the different projects and also see if there could be any collaborations that could be sparked because there may have been groups uh, working on perhaps related projects or related approaches. Um, so we've run over the last three weeks a couple of events focused on a design sprint where we had presentations by um, uh, 21 initiatives. It was a, a wide range of projects uh, going all the way from technology tools and platforms and perhaps suggestions around metadata standards to the more social infrastructure element of incentivizing participation and looking into training and mentoring. So we had an initial uh, uh, event where we, we heard about all of these cool projects. Um, we took an opportunity to provide feedback as part of that event. And then uh, for the following three weeks, and uh, we had a follow-up event just yesterday. So I'm very happy to give you the latest news on that, uh, where we heard the, how the different groups had updated their initiatives. Um, and I think for, for us at Ace of Bio, one of the success stories was that there were quite a few groups who actually either had already implemented collaborations by merging initiatives, or they mentioned that they had been in touch with some other presenters to explore that in the future. Um, we awarded five uh, uh, awards uh, to a number of the initiatives, which I mentioned here, and there will be information on the website, so feel free to check it there. But one highlight I would make for this is that out of the five awards, three of them were, went to a couple of uh, initiatives really focused on the social and uh, participa encouraging participation and community engagement element, which I think, again, underscores the need for all of that in addition to, the, to having the platforms and tools available. Um, so a few other things that we put in place to, again, try to uh, continue the engagement, also not only about preprint review, but about preprints more generally. We have started a program of community calls, which we run uh, every other month, more or less. Um, and we run them uh, with themes for each of the calls. As it's really an opportunity really to share information about each of the themes with our community members, but also to get community feedback. We may provide updates on ongoing projects. So it's, 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 a, it's a nice way to have that two-way conversation as, as we progress on specific initiatives. And then I wanted to uh, just spend a couple of minutes uh, talking a little bit about the ASAP Bio Fellows Program, which is very close to my heart. We started it um, uh, this year. Um, and as I mentioned, we had had a, a community for a number of years, and we were hoping that um, those community members would become experts in preprints and essentially become a go-to people for perhaps their local communities or, or, or groups uh, operating in their disciplines. Um, but as we were thinking as to how we work with our community, we felt that if we really wanted to empower the community members to, to, to be those advocates, we need to provide them with perhaps a little bit more structure and more concrete tools as to you know, how to go about uh, doing just that. And that was the motivation for uh, starting this fellows program. Um, we started it this year in a, as a six month effort. 
Um, we had 26 participants from uh, a number of continents, and it has been a fantastic experience just sharing information with them and getting to know them um, in, in different formats. We have monthly calls. Um, and the other important thing that they have done as part of this is that they actually self-organize into projects which they conceptualize and chose depending on the skills that they wanted to develop and that was interesting to them. Um, and it has been amazing to see all of the things that they have done. I posted a few here, but there are many more. Again, I, I encourage you to go to the, to the website and, and check this. Um, they have taken the steps to do community engagement through, through blog posts and sharing surveys and gathering information about journal clubs and other items. They've run one of our community calls. They run a webinar by themselves about how to, uh, about different elements of, of preprints, develop many infographics, which they have also translated to, to three more languages, which I'm very, very proud of. So it's, it's been an amazing um, opportunity really to work with them. And it's one of the, I guess, silver linings from this year that we did everything online and everyone was quite attuned to that format and, and it worked quite well from that perspective. So with that, I I'm, I'm just want to finish with this quote that I thought was quite nice because I'm, I'm a, a great supporter of community engagement, uh, which is by uh, Lowell uh, Levin, who was a, a public health professor looking on, uh, working on public health policy and promotion. But I think he put, put it quite well in the terms of remember to always listen to the community because they will know what the problems are and often they know what the best solutions will be to those problems. So always keep your community mind. And with that, I leave it there. My contact details uh, are there. Feel free to get in touch. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to address any questions. Oops, I will find my mic. <laughs> thank you, Rachia. Um, that was wonderful. We will, however, move, leave questions until the other two speakers, if that's okay, so that we can try and get through everyone in a timely manner. Uh, so the next speak, uh, speaker is uh, Peter, who is the founder and chairman of Open Knowledge Maps. Uh, Open Knowledge Maps is a charitable nonprofit dedicated to increasing the visibility of research findings for science and society alike. Um, it operates the world's largest visual search engine for research. Peter himself is a member of the GoFair, exec the GoFair Executive Board, coordinator of the GoFair uh, implementation Network on Discovery, and he's a core team member of the Open Science Network in Austria. Uh, a long-term open science advocate, he is known for coining the term open methodology, and also for his leading role in creating the Vienna Principles, a vision for scholarly communication in the 21st century. Prior to founding Open Knowledge Maps, Peter was a senior researcher managing the topic of open science at the No Center, which is Austria's leading research center for data-driven business and big data analytics. Um, are you okay to get going, Peter? Yes, thank you very Great. much. Great, thank I'm you. I'm going to share my screen with you. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to talk to you about open knowledge maps today. And uh, I'd like to start with saying that this presentation was co-created with uh, fellow open knowledge map board member, Maxi Schramm. The topic that uh, keeps us awake at night at open knowledge maps is I think very well summarized in this image. It's that uh, in the pandemic, we've seen a lot of knowledge being produced in a very short amount of time. And that made it very difficult for researchers and everyone else to uh, get an overview of the topic and once they had it to then also keep it. But I think it's not only the pandemic. I think we all feel sometimes a little bit like this person here, which is the swamp with the literature. Conservatively estimated, around 3 million articles are published each year. And that brings a, about a lot of problems for discoverability uh, inside of academia, but also outside. And this is also reflected in the numbers. We can see that there is a high unsightedness of publications between 7 and 63%, depending on the discipline. You can also see that there is a high unsightedness of um, 
data sets. This is a study that I was also involved in. We found that up to 85% of research data is never reused. And finally, um, when it comes to the transfer to practice, this is where it gets really bleak because even in an application oriented discipline such as medicine, only a small amount of the research um, is transferred to practice and if so often with a considerable delay. So we can conclude that there is a discoverability crisis and it negatively impacts the quality and also the efficiency of science because you can imagine if you don't have all the relevant prior knowledge, well then probably the quality um, will suffer and also you will reinvent the wheel um, several times even if you don't want to. Right? It's not to say that we are not advocating for reproducibility studies, but if you're doing the same thing over and over again, the same outcome, then probably there is some efficiency to be had there. And as we have seen this year, the transfer to practice is especially important as it has oftentimes a direct impact on human lives. One of the reasons that we are in the discoverability crisis is the tools that we have for search and exploration because um, search engines are still king and um, Google Scholar is um, the widest used search engine, I would say. But how do you actually get an overview of a scientific field such as COVID-19 with Google Scholar? Well, what most people would do, and myself included, I would go to the interface and type in the term, and then I would get hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of results. Since I cannot read 210,000 papers, what most people do is they um, go to the first highly cited overview work, um, read through this one, go through the references, and then essentially hand by hand go through the items in the list. But how do you know that this is the most relevant item for you at this point? How do you know which discipline is even in? There is very little context to go on here. There is just a small snippet um, that tells you about the term in context, but mostly there is not a lot of, uh, not, not, there are not a lot of things to go on as to whether you can decide whether this is something that's actually interesting to you. And the filters here on the left hand side, they're not of not much use either because they're just too unspecific and actually they haven't changed in 10 years. So um, 2010, there were the same filters. So Google simply has not innovated in this interface. And going through articles one by one by hand, that may be possible in the first year of the PhD. But other than that, this usually takes too much time. And that's time that we don't have, especially not in a global health emergency. And so this was um, the starting point for open knowledge maps. We thought there must be a better way to gain an overview of a scientific field. And so we started a charitable nonprofit and our mission is to revolutionize discovery. And we want to do that not only for science, but all for all the other stakeholders in society as well. And our idea is to use knowledge maps for discovery and they have a number of advantages over uh, list-based interfaces. You can see in this example for heart diseases, you have the main areas at a glance. So in this case, risk factors, types of diseases and prevention. And you also have relevant resources that are already attached to each of these areas. So you can get immediately started. From the theory to the practice, and here I will quickly stop my screen share and just start another one that is actually optimized for uh, video output. Bear with me. Um, so if you go to our website, openknowledgemaps.org, you can create a knowledge map of your own. You can select between two databases, PubMed, the big database in the life sciences, and um, also BASE, the Bielefeld Academic Search Engine, which indexes now more than 250 million scientific documents from all disciplines. You can then type in your uh, topic. I took digital education as an example, and uh, we then create the knowledge map for you. And as you can see, it looks very similar to the example that I showed in that you have 
the main areas at a glance. So in this case, for example, education systems, education policy, also down here, digital literacy. And once you've identified an area that you're really interested in, say this one up here around digital competence, then you can zoom into it. You can see the areas are the papers that are related to this area. You can look at the metadata. And if an article is open access, then you can all also view it directly within our interface. So the advantages that we see is that you have this bird's eye view of a field. You can identify relevant concepts, which is sometimes the most difficult step in any discovery, um, in every, any discovery process. What words are you actually going to type into the search engine? So if you didn't know that digital literacy was a part of digital education, well, now you do. You can also so what's the relevant from the irrelevant in regards to your research question, your information need. So you may only want to stay in the bubble around digital competence in the beginning and then branch out only later. And finally, open knowledge maps is an interface over all scientific knowledge, open and closed. But we will make it always very easy to get to the open content. And we also offer additional services for the open content, such as the uh, annotation software hypothesis. With this approach, we've become the largest visual search engine for research. Um, since May 2016, we had more than 4 million page views, more than 250,000 maps were created. And we've also had many online and offline workshops with uh, more than 3,000 participants around the world. We were also honored to receive the Austrian Prize for, few, uh, for Free Knowledge and the Open Minds Award, the Austrian Open Source Award. All of our services are free and open, so we want to go the whole way of open science here. Um, you've already seen the innovative search and discovery services. Um, we, you have seen the integrations for BASE and PubMed. We also have a service that builds on top of open air and is able to visualize project outputs. Uh, we also have a wide range of training activities and materials that you can download on our website and customize for yourself. Also, our software is uh, licensed under MIT and available from GitHub. And we have uh, support, community support and engagement programs that I will talk also a little bit about in a second. Our team um, consists of uh, mostly volunteers who are working together on this together with me. Um, Michela Vignoria, our community coordinator, is also on the call today. So feel free to um, chat with her or ask questions also to both of us. We also have an organizational member, the No Center, which is my former organization. We also found many advisors from all around the world, from the open science and open knowledge space, which uh, help us in creating and uh, further developing the organization. Uh, you may know many of them, such as Natalia Manora, who is the project director of Open Air, or Klaus Tochtermann, who is the director of the Leibniz Information a center for economics. Yeah, we couldn't do our work without our supporting members. Uh, maintaining the platform costs money, and that's why we're very uh, grateful to our supporting members who uh, help us in that regard. And our supporting members then get a say in the further development of the technical roadmap. We also found many partners from the open science and open knowledge space um, because we see ourselves as a building block of the open digital ecosystem and uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel but rather work together. That's uh, why we are also part of many networks such as the Open Science Network Austria and GoFair in order to uh, help and co-create this infrastructure. I talked about our community program a little bit earlier. This is the enthusiasts program. So these are 
um, power users and ambassadors from all around the world who have workshops in their own communities and often in parts of the world that we can rarely go to ourselves. And they then report the feedback from their community back to us. And that's very important because we want to create an inclusive system that really works for everyone in the world and not just for the people that we are able to talk to or that usually sit at the tables where we also sit. Yeah, and together we're creating something that I would call the open discovery infrastructure. So we have institutions, researchers and publishers, and uh, they com contribute to libraries, archives, repositories and aggregators. Um, this is just a small selection here on the right hand side. Um, pro probably your institution is also already part of this infrastructure, because the only thing that you need is an open data interface. It's an open data interface that we can access the materials that you have. And this is then um, used by meta aggregators such as OpenAI, Core, Base, and Wikidata, who aggregate all of this information and make it available again via an open data interface. And this is where the value added services come in. We talked about open knowledge maps, but there are many, many others such as Orchid, Unpaywar, Content Mine, Refigure, or Scoria. And this then creates a cycle, a cycle of continuous innovation. And suddenly we can do things in discovery that we couldn't do before. And we can react very quickly also within a pandemic to create new tools and to create new links between our tools in order to uh, fulfill certain use cases. And one example for this is a project that we're working on at the moment together with uh, Refigure and that is called Covis. And in COVID, the idea was to bring together the most reliable research on COVID-19 in biomedicine. Because it's really hard among the tens of thousands of articles to identify the seminal ones. And it might be difficult in the beginning, but then also staying on top of this can be a very daunting task for researchers. So if you go to our website on openknowledgemaps.org slash COVID, you can um, look at the knowledge map that we've created. So this gives you an overview of um, key areas within biomedicine that are related to COVID-19. So there are vaccines, therapeutics, immunity, epidemiology, and so on. And once you've identified an area, we can again zoom into it. And as you can see, there are now a number of resources related to it. Um, there are also comments which further give context to the individual items. They can be data sets, journal articles, preprints, reviews, and then we've also included um, refigures. And refigures are now a way to pool or to bring together different research outcomes. This was the question around hydroxychloroquine, which came up early in the pandemic. And here the team of Refigure has put together um, the different outcomes, the different findings in a visual dashboard, and also provided a synthesis of the findings. Yeah, um, as I just said, the knowledge map is curated by the team of Refigure together with input from the community. And it's designed and developed by Open Knowledge Maps. The data source in this case is a spreadsheet. Um, that was the easiest way for us to set it up. So this was done in just a few months time. Um, we set up this spreadsheet um, and uh, connected it to our knowledge maps in order to make it possible to have a fully curated knowledge map. So as I said, um, I think you will have seen many examples and I think also today we've heard about many examples from the open infrastructure, how it helped within the pandemic but there is an unfortunate reality at the same time is that this infrastructure is really needed, but it's also very fragile. 
as Kathleen Taney here summarized it, I think, quite very well, is that most systems, most parts of this bedrock of research really would go away within just six months if they did not receive any further funding. And this is a big problem because um, we cannot leave it to the commercial vendors, to the proprietary vendors to fix this. Um, they are looking more towards the bottom line and they may make some of their resources available, provide some sort of free access that they can take away at any moment's notice. And I hope that within the next pandemic, we won't need these freebies anymore because we have a fully open infrastructure that is just there and that we can just reuse and that we can really react in time. But of course, the question is, how can you sustain an infrastructure that gives everything away for free? And as you can imagine, we have also thought quite a bit about this at Open Knowledge Maps. And our idea and our model is a membership-based funding model, which we think is most suited to our case. And here, organizations become supporting members and they provide a yearly contribution. And in return, we invite our members to co-create the platform with us. So you become part of the board of supporters, you're directly involved in the decision-making process of what features and sources are implemented on Open Knowledge Maps. These are the three membership categories that we have, depending on how many members you have on the board of supporters, starting from 2,800 euros per year. And one of the things that we've now already looked at with our current supporting members is that we want to go in the direction of institutional services. For example, that we offer a custom search that you can embed or your, on your website and then only restrict to the sources from your institution or from your region or from those sources that are most interesting to your researchers. Of course, again, this will be an open service and we, it will be available to everyone, but we believe that this um, then brings about a certain useful interplay between open knowledge maps and the organizations where we can learn more about their needs um, and include them in the technical roadmap in addition to the needs of the community that we get from the enthusiasts program and by our other channels and the needs of the platform which are managed by us. We're a community driven initiative so your support matters so please Give us feedback, tell us what you think. If you think that Open Knowledge Maps could be useful to your colleagues, to your researchers, to your students, um, please introduce them to our tool. And yeah, consider becoming a supporting member, consider becoming an enthusiast, consider becoming involved in Open Knowledge Maps. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to um, your questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Peter. There was a lot in there that I found particularly interesting. So, but like everybody else, I'm going to have to wait while we hear from our third speaker. And so, our third speaker at is Gurija. And as we were just hearing uh, about Refigure, she's a co creator of Refigure. Um, Refigure was launched in August 2017 and it allows researchers to save and organize journal figures as actionable and creditable findings. And this particularly benefits early career researchers. Uh, Garija is an immunologist and she's currently a senior research scientist at the Institute for Biology, Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. Uh, that's where she completed her medical degree and doctorate. And after that, she was a postdoctoral researcher at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, her profile says that she obsesses about scholarly comms and open science. Uh, so I'm definitely looking forward to hearing from her. Uh, uh, are you ready? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um... So I'm going to switch between a presentation and a demo today, uh, but I did want to take the first few slides to actually talk about the collaboration that Peter mentioned, which is um, 
on um, COVIS, uh, which is a, a, a visual uh, display of about uh, 120 top, find, uh, 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 top findings in COVID that we feel are reliable, uh, where a single article did not address the finding in question. We have collected either multiple articles or created a refigure, which I'll describe uh, later. And uh, I am a career scientist. I've uh, spent uh, almost two decades on the bench now. And so uh, my perspective is both from someone who uh, uh, does, spends a lot of time and a lot of energy uh, um, uh, you know, doing science and uh, then struggling with making it available, uh, struggling with repli uh, reproducibility issues, and uh, uh, that is part of the incentive motivation behind creating a refigure and innovating in this space with partners such as Open Knowledge Maps. Um, so uh, the partnership uh, uh, on COVID actually started earlier uh, this year, of course, when the pandemic was spread spreading. And this is a slide from very early uh, in the pandemic, where you can see that uh, pre about uh, it says you know 25 to 30 preprints were being submitted every uh, day. And in fact, peer reviewed journals on uh, peer reviewed articles on COVID-19 were in a minority. Uh, you would hear, uh, as you've heard from ASAP Bio today, you would hear uh, uh, you know, major news articles saying, uh, referring to a paper or analysis, but then not be able to track it down. And very often the news article would not make it clear if it was a peer reviewed journal, if the science had been peer reviewed or not. Uh, this led to major crises such as the hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, story, where, which uh, of course was highly politicized, especially in the United States uh, and um, led to um, uh, major problems. Uh, I updated this yesterday. So uh, this uh, preprints have really helped to get all of this uh, uh, rapid science that's happening on a coronavirus uh, very rapidly out. And there are now at uh, yesterday's count more than uh, 10,000 articles in just this one platform, uh, which includes bio, uh, bio archive and med archive. Uh, this, as with um, most sites, this is a list-based uh, search interface that you find. And frankly, for researchers like me, this was getting quite overwhelming even six to eight months back when uh, there was a fraction of this article, uh, this uh, number of articles. Uh, uh, early on, there was a lot of publicity for data sets, uh, which are, uh, again, built for machines and not for humans. As a researcher, uh, I was struggling with, two, uh, with uh, several questions, some of which are listed here. One is, uh, how do I find actionable research on COVID that allows me to formulate a research plan for my own laboratory? Which findings are reproducible and have been reported by multiple groups? What are the key findings that I should keep in mind? Should I be coming to this field for the first time? Many researchers around the world pivoted to COVID-19 research. Uh, they, had, they did not have a background in uh, viral or even coronavirus research. So they really need a solid base to start with. Um, where can I share and comment on what I think is important or, or conversely unreliable? How do I keep track, it, track of it all? Where is there a single place where I can look for preprints, journal articles, and databases together? Where can I find collaborators who are working on a similar or a complementary solution? Uh, I will not claim that we have uh, um, uh, addressed all of these, but we have addressed several issues uh, with COVIS uh, where um, you can now go and find um, most important reproducible research sorted into categories. Uh, it's very visual, it's very easy to find. Our curation team consists of community uh, reviewers. So uh, uh, we have people who are finding research in their own uh, expert areas 
and uh, contributing to it. We have a, a contribution page where you can uh, say that this is research that you think is important and it should be uh, included. So this is how the collaboration with Open Knowledge Maps to create COVIS uh, came about. And I do hope uh, um, that you uh, guys uh, visit uh, Open Knowledge Maps uh, and COVIS and check it out. I'm now, now going to move on to uh, Refigure, uh, which is a project uh, um, that we have been working on uh, for several years now. We are a socially minded uh, startup and our uh, mission is to make science more democratic, remixable, crowdsourced and rapid. Uh, I want to uh, especially mention my co-founder, Dr. James Aiken, who's also in the call today, as well as main support that we have received over the years from MIT Press, from eLife, uh, which partly funded the first uh, version of uh, Refigure uh, from Force 11, as well as the Mozilla Science Lab. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, have a very small team uh, and uh, again, a thanks also to Mass Life Sciences Center with, uh, through where we get several very talented uh, undergraduate uh, uh, or community college students to um, serve out their internships in, uh, uh, at Refigure and their work has been immensely, immensely valuable. So what is the problem? Uh, I discussed one pro uh, several problems earlier, but if you look at the structure of a scientific paper in biomedicine, it's basically a vertical stack. In fact, it's a pretty much a silo. Each uh, paper is made up of multiple figures and supplemental figures. This re represents years of data and each figure in itself can contain many actionable findings. Uh, what happens with the storytelling uh, sort of long form uh, format is that we leave the author to connect these findings. And, uh, and sometimes we, in fact, if the author wants to get published, they are forced to connect these findings. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, as a researcher, you may, not, may disagree with the, the story behind the paper, but you might agree with many, many findings in each individual experiment. Uh, these tens to hundreds uh, findings per paper are often behind a pay, uh, paywall. And again, to uh, reiterate my point, this represents a silo of years and years of work. So on Refigure, very simply, users save, remix, and discuss scientific findings as collections of figures. I'm going to uh, and uh, give you a demo and then I will come back to uh, some uh, use cases. So let's say uh, you were reading uh, this article uh, and uh, I wanted to create a collection uh, which featured uh, this uh, figure and perhaps figures from other preprints, other journal uh, journals, other repositories. But in this case, my collection is basically uh, independent of what the uh, author's interpretation is. Perhaps I'm commenting on whether this finding has been um, uh, uh, seen in other papers. Perhaps I'm commenting on the uh, reagent used to create this image. Uh, it, it really depends on the use case. So if I um, uh, hit uh, create a new refigure and this extension is freely available uh, from the Chrome store, uh, I can give it a meaningful title. In this case, I will just say uh, OpenCon uh, test. You can uh, provide a description which you'll see is very, really a synthesis of your collection. You can provide keywords. You can keep this uh, collection private or make it openly available. So I hit create here. And if I hit uh, click on the refigure or on the figure, you'll find that the figure, uh, the, basically the um, uh, extension will tell you that the figure has been collected for many platforms. It will auto uh, capture uh, the URL of the article the legend, um, you can write your own notes um, here. You could uh, write, uh, have uh, all the authors here. 
this does not uh, happen with every journal, but, um, but uh, we've, uh, we've tried to um, uh, make it uh, work for several uh, sources. And basically this uh, uh, captured uh, uh, figure will show up as part of your collection here. Uh, and um, you can keep adding to this collection and create a multiple uh, visual, um, um, uh, visual insights into one collection. I'm going to go back to my presentation now. Can uh, people uh, see the, this presentation? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, um, so the, let me uh, share the use cases. The first one, which actually uh, Peter also referred to is uh, uh, basically collections on COVID. And in this, ca uh, this case, this is uh, on hydroxychloroquine, which is a widely prescribed drug. Um, and uh, uh, there was some uh, data suggesting that it might be uh, beneficial in COVID. It turned out that there were issues with the analysis of the data and um, uh, uh, um, you know, different studies reported different things. So what our curation team led by Joe in this case uh, did um, that they actually collected um, five uh, different um, uh, studies. So instead of your uh, analysis of this uh, question being informed, by, the, by a single paper that you ran across or a single news article, you could actually go and find all the open uh, studies that we could track in one single visual da uh, dashboard. Um, uh, this also allowed us to provide public commentary and review of preprints. Many of the fig figures featured in, refigure, uh, in refigures, as we call these visual uh, collections are from preprints. And this allows readers, experts, informed citizens, and librarians to comment on reproducibility uh, or in, uh, uh, showcase new insights. Another use case here from Stephanie, whose uh, picture you saw, saw earlier, who is an undergraduate student, is uh, the uh, refigure is being used for student research projects. Uh, for instance, in this case, you see a very valuable uh, collection, again, created from multiple articles. Uh, so you see here, there are a total of five images. In this case, all the five images are actually coming from different articles. Uh, where Stephanie is commenting on the infection and severity of COVID-19 and the differences in men and women. Um, this is a, a, an extremely valuable uh, resource and uh, we really uh, uh, democratized, uh, this is uh, uh, the research and allowed an undergrad stu uh, student to have this ability to do this. Um, a student research can be directly deposited into refigure.org. This is a new backend repository feature that we are about to release in uh, January 2021. Uh, student research from anywhere can be uh, refigured uh, in, in either institutional or publicly available repositories, for instance. Educators, librarians, and peers can also create educational resources uh, um, using this tool. Use case three, which we just started discussions on over the last year, which were halted by uh, the pandemic, are uh, whether this would be uh, valuable to publishers. Often publisher uh, uh, web pages look like this. There is a, you know, a, a list of issues and a list of articles. And again, this is not a very engaging way to present uh, the information. And it's also, um, a, a, you know, a, an article uh, really has uh, its most of its view in early in its life when it's being shared in social media and all. And this allows, um, uh, publishers to really evergreen their content. They can um, create visual collections. Uh, they can actually, if uh, they feel that some of their older articles have, uh, let's say, a relevance to a very topical issue such as the pandemic, they could create collections like that. Um, th that's just uh, shown here. Um, how is refigure helping uh, during COVID? I'm again going to uh, step out of my presentation for a minute and show you the multiple uh, COVID um, um, 
uh, refigures that we have. So we have, it shows uh, 24 refigures. I think some of these are still in process. I'm logged in. So uh, you see all the refigures that are actually in the dashboard, but I believe we have around 15 that are publicly available ready for, which have been reviewed, looked, uh, looked at by multiple people. Uh, and uh, they range on different topics, neurological consequences of COVID-19 infection, uh, COVID-19 and coagulation, could BCG vaccine help to alleviate COVID-19 infection and reduce mortality? Uh, so um, again, uh, we are trying our best to use this tool to um, uh, help during the pandemic. Um, I just have a final slide to conclude. Uh, oops, my thoughts. Um, uh, this is our contact information here. Refigure is free to use. You just have to download the extension and the code is available open source. I encourage you all to try it and try to create your first collection today. I can, um, I'll just leave the share on in case people had some questions, but I'm happy. I think uh, it's uh, question answer uh, time round. Yeah. That's yeah, that's correct. So thank you again to all of our speakers. And yep, yeah, so or actually, actually, I think the, the, fir the, the first question that's come in is, is 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 from you. So if you want to if you want to unmute and ask it, that's great. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for the to the other speakers for really insightful uh, presentations. And I, I had a question, and I will acknowledge my total bias by the fact that I, I used to work at journals where we had to you know have a few headaches about licensing. But I just wonder how you handle the the license for the article, whether it matters at all for you to actually reproduce the figure. You know, depending on whether the article has an open license that allows any reuse or not, or it's behind the paywall, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so um, you, uh, it, it's actually a very complicated uh, question. I'll try to break it down. So users can refigure whatever they have access to. And unfortunately, we can't take responsibility for policing them, but we encourage them that if they, uh, if they are, um, uh, uh, you know, pulling from uh, copyright protected sources that they either uh, make sure to check it. Uh, very often users will actually choose to keep their collections private, which is actually an interesting behavior that we hadn't thought of, but they, it, sometimes it's just that they don't want to press the extra button, but also it turned out that people are very, um, you know, uh, these are scientists in training or scientists, they, they, they don't take their, collections lightly to that you know for them they want to make sure there was no spelling mistake before they share it so uh, so far it has not been a problem the um, uh, other thing is many uh, many many of our I would say figures come from open access uh, uh, articles the other thing is we actually do not host the figure so what it's doing is it's embedded. So it's just thinking out. So it's actually to the benefit of the publishers. And we, when we look at our site, we see much outgoing traffic to the publisher's site. So in a, in a sense, we are actually creating, we are telling uh, readers where the users choose to share that, look, there is this interesting figure, go read it, right? So um, um, yeah. So the questions don't have an easy answer, but it hasn't been a problem in more. Uh, in fact, it's been to the benefit of the publishers. Thank you. Um, I've got a Quick a question that's coming is um, to um, Arache. So one of the things that um, there seemed to be um, one of the the sort of I guess not pastimes of um, 2020 has also been looking at like um, new funder policies that come in. So um, there's been quite a lot of um, noise about the new Welcome Trust away policy and its requirement for research to be made available as preprints if there's a public health benefit. 
Um, I wonder, which I think, you know, personally is a, is a positive, you know, is a positive step forward, but um, is this something that, yeah, just if you wanted to, well, any of the panelists really, if you wanted to sort of share your, your thoughts on that and sort of any engagement that you've seen from funders bar the ones that are obviously sort of funding um, ASAP Bio in the first place? Uh, sure. Well, I, I'm, obviously, we're very supportive of uh, the Welcome Trust uh, move um, in support of preprints. I had to say to to give them total credit that they, they've been quite clear that this relates to essentially sharing all of the information that relates to public health crisis. So they they are also very progressive in terms of um, data sharing, etc. I think it's a great move that underscores the value of open science and how we have seen fantastic progress this year that wouldn't have been possible without all of the researchers coming together, the collaborations that are allowed by rapid sharing and open sharing, etc. Um, in terms of funders, um, I mean, obviously, there are many funders still that don't necessarily have policies uh, around preprints. Um, so we are hoping to see some, uh, I guess, move in, in, in the direction of being more encouraging of preprints in the future. And I think that what has happened this year uh, will really give a boost uh, of, of progress in that direction. There are a couple of uh, examples of funders that are very encouraging of preprints and actually have even mandated preprints across the board, not only in the context of a public health crisis, um, and these are the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And another ASAP that is not us is Aligning Science Across Parkinson's. I'm reading so I don't you know, mistake the ASAPs. Um, but this, uh, uh, this funder with a focus on Parkinson's is taking a very clear progressive move towards open science. Again, they, they are mandating preprints, but also um, a data sharing and sharing of protocols, sharing of all of the outputs. And I think the interesting thing that I hope other funders will also adopt is that um, this funder is taking the step of actually including uh, funding for project managers who will support training and the deposition pro pro process for all of these outputs, because I think we also need to recognize that open science with all of its benefits take, can take a little bit of extra effort. Um, so I think that's interesting, an interesting move that they are dedicating resources to, to do that extra support for the open science practices. And I hope the other funders will move in that direction. Thank you. Um, I think we also have a question for Peter, um, which was, why would you want to restrict um, an open knowledge map search to an institution? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's, of course, um, a very good question. And sometimes um, it's really all about, or most of the time, it's probably we want to search in the widest data source that's possible, right? I think that's always the first search that any researcher wants to do. But after that, um, we have learned that a lot of researchers, um, they become more specialized, right? They will go to a certain data source that they've identified as especially interesting, or maybe they're interested really in the resources that they can actually access from their institution's licensing, right? And um, also, there are um, also within institutions often special collections that researchers work on, right? Your institution may be specialized um, in, um, let's say, collecting all the cartoons from British newspapers, and that just happens to be your research subject, right? And then it's very important to also narrow it down. And uh, since we cannot provide all these ways of narrowing down, I think that's where the institutions would come in and then provide these kind of custom solutions that um, allow you to do this later on. A second function that it has, and that's uh, probably more interesting for the institutions themselves, is that you can embed any knowledge map that you create wherever you want, right? So this might be a way to showcase the output that you've actually produced in a very new and um, very, I think, useful way for institutions. So this might be another um, use case where you want to go. 
And this can expand, you can think about maybe showcasing the open access efforts at your institution, but then maybe also on a regional or on a national level. So these are the kind of use cases that we're discussing at the moment. But um, if you have an additional one, of course, we are always happy to hear about that um, and see how we can make it possible. Great, thank you. Um, I've also just got a, a general question for all the, all the panelists. Um, Peter, in your talk uh, towards the end, you talked about the issue of sustainability and how fragile uh, the ecosystem is. Um, do you think the pandemic will change the culture of openness in the long term and in a positive or negative way? So this is for, for anyone to answer. I can have a go and hopefully the other panelists will, will, will agree or disagree, we'll see. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that what we will see is essentially more progress in terms of adoption of open science for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, I always make this parallel with uh, what we, had, we have seen it with preprints, but often the issue is not necessarily one of reluctance, but more of I'm not familiar with how to do this. So I'll just go about my usual practice because again, the burden is lower. So I think we have seen much more attention to um, modes of sharing and again, of increasing collaboration, etc. So there is increased awareness among researchers. And then I'm hoping that there will be a recognition of the value that openness has brought to again, making sure that we could address the, the, the crisis that was unfolding. And I don't think we, we would have gotten to the point of having so many promising vaccines in December if, if we hadn't worked in this open manner. So I'm, I'm hoping that there will be some, some progress in, in that direction. The question about sustainability is, a, I think, a perennial one in this space. So I'm hoping that maybe we, we, we'll come back to that with a, perhaps more creative options. And as with many things, we, we'll, we'll, we'll have a number of approaches to this. Um, again, I, I've seen some membership models, some other things. We may need to take different approaches to make sure that different initiatives are, are supported. Um, I would also like to add to this as a Ben scientist, I see a very clear positive and a very clear negative emerging, but also I would like to express a hope. The positive I saw was that in science practitioners, uh, uh, the acceptability of treating a preprint as an actionable piece of uh, science really uh, was you know earlier because on any other topic you would have had 90 uh, journal articles and maybe five preprints and five databases or something like that covid really changed that if i wanted the latest information i had to rely on preprints and it really got over the hurdle of sort of treating them as the sec poor second cousin or you know uh, uh, something like that uh, unfortunately, when it came to publishing, I feel that as scientists, we are still subject to the same pressures and career um, issues and stuff. I, uh, however, preprint, however many preprints I published during the COVID period, uh, I don't think they will count, unfortunately, towards uh, you know uh, productivity very often or or the CV. So I feel that that we, we just feel even more beleaguered given how the world has changed during COVID. But my hope is that having seen how preprints really contributed to dissemination of science, that funders will actually engage more. We, uh, I remember the conversations in 2019 were about funder fatigue and many of our collaborators who are nonprofits and ourselves who are small startups we were struggling. And of course, 2020 in some cases has made things worse on that front, but I hope that this leads to a re-engagement uh, with the topic. So from my point of view, um, I can absolutely um, agree with Girish and Hirache on the point that uh, COVID really has shown a light on open science once and for all. And I think no one can argue away that it's needed. I think this is something that the pandemic has done for us is that this is now something that is just something that we need. And I don't think that we will have to have too many arguments about that anymore in the future. 
a lot of people in the past have said, yeah, but it's, is it really more effective or, you know, and I think, you know, this is going to go away. The big negative that I see is that in the economic troubles that are coming or that are already here, we see that many of the budgets get cut. And that's where I fear that open science initiatives and open infrastructures might be the first ones that are on the chopping block. And um, this, of course, would go counter to this um, need that is now very clear. Um, and I think that's where we as a community really need to stand together and really help each other out and make sure that it, this doesn't happen, um, but it requires everyone. And uh, open science has become a bit more split up. There are many different directions in that we went. There are still, there's still a little bit of this um, infighting and I think we just have to stop that and really um, stick together that would be um, my main hope for for the next year I think I think every scientist wants their work to have the the, the best possible impact and the widest possible impact so I think open access is attractive for that reason and I think the push from the funders to uh, to acknowledge open access research is really important because that also sends a signal that that this is important research and these are important contributions and and that even if to a degree you can't you know you can't publish as well on it um potentially then on other projects this this is still something that's sort of that you can put on your cv and that will advance your career and i think i think that's a really important development okay thank you everyone I'm glad that people are in general quite positive about the future of open science. <laughs> um, Rachel, do you have any uh, final questions? I don't think I do. So as such, I think it, it falls to me to, to wrap up yep. today. Excellent. Um, yeah, I sort of wanted to, um, in the past, I've kind of, tried to you know sort of summarize the things that we've covered um during the course of um during the course of the event um and obviously today we've heard about sort of um fit for purpose open access um and the role of library and open access publishing in that um certainly how open access helped um bolster modelling of the transmission of COVID-19 in a way that obviously should then support um, our response to future challenges, the communities and initiatives that are rallying around preprints and the acceleration of these around the pandemic, which is something that we've, we've seen at, at Crossref as well. Um, how knowledge maps can save you from reading over 200,000 papers um, on, on COVID-19, um, but also um, how saving and, re you know, open access also helps with the saving, remixing and the discussion of scientific, scientific fi findings. And I would say, like, the thing that also comes through is that, that this is, this is really, you know, even with information being openly available, it's still really hard work. And I think the other thing that came through is that we're really dependent on our communities to support these from, you know, undergrad students taking advantage of refigure to, you know, bigger corporations like, IB, like IBMs of this world to the NHS to um, just being able to, to be part of communities, to be able to, to sort of support each other's work is, is, is really important and, and more so in, um, in such a crazy year. So I'll just sign off again by thanking our speakers again, um, to my fantastic um, co-organizers and obviously to all of our attendees as well. So thanks for taking the time to join us, engage and, and to ask questions. Um, so yeah, um, thanks again, um, enjoy your weekends and we'll hopefully be back next year. Thanks, Thank bye. you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye.